Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Poems for People Who Hate Poetry. And today, we're going to give you more reasons to hate poetry. No, I'm kidding. But what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about William Cowper's last poem, The Castaway. Now, you've probably never heard of this poem. I never heard of this poem until recently, until I started reading through this book, uh, English Romantic Verse, and this is going to be one of a series of poems I'm doing on romantic verse. And my reasoning is that I think romantic verse is probably the best poetry I've read thus far. Now, besides talking about this poem, I always want to try to leave you with a couple nuggets of why poetry matters. And you may think, you know, the the way that I phrased and, and talked about this particular poem is that it is tragic and sad. And one of the things I've learned in reading a lot of great literature, reading a lot of great poetry, and even looking at uh, great art in general, is if wisdom means anything, wisdom seems to come not from smiles, but from sadness or some kind of tragedy. There seems to be more in the tragedy that brings us to some kind of wisdom on earth while we're here, figuring this thing out rather than only when you're happy. That's not to say that happiness is bad, but to get to the happiness, you often have to go through the tragedies and it seems to be a part of life and it's something that we should try to figure out. So today I'm going to read this poem and I want to, you know, reemphasize this theme that I've been talking about of poetry in general, that poetry is not separate or different than the part of our brain that solves problems. It seems to be, and from what I'm gathering and understanding in my reading of it, even though we we believe that there's this creative function in our minds that is complete, like some people have it more than others, some other people don't. And, you know, therefore it's, it's like this magical entity, I have to fix this thing, it's this magical entity that um, may work for some people, may not for others. And, and some people are just engineers, some people are just artists. And there's true, there's some truth to that where some people are more, uh, have more inclination toward one versus the other, but that doesn't mean that each shouldn't study and understand the other. And I think it's necessary, for instance, I don't think it's possible to become a good person without reading poetry and literature. That's one of my claims. And I don't mean mere, just, you know, you can't be uber rich in, in material wealth, but one thing you'll notice about people like that is they tend to, um, you know, after a while they can get uh, a, a lacking of spiritual wealth. And then on the flip side, you'll see some people that seem to have spiritual wealth, but they don't have material wealth. I believe both should be sought after. I believe you should achieve material and spiritual wealth. And one way to uh, to achieve, and also that the spiritual actually fuels the material wealth. Now, this poem has a lot of tragedy to it. Oh, a fly just flew right into my face. Has a lot of tragedy to it, but there's a universality to it. And here's one of my arguments for even if it's a tragic poem, you should be listening to it even if you don't want to experience tragedy. And the biggest thing is that poetry is really a form of thinking. It sharpens your senses, and it helps you see the world more clearly. But most importantly, it's a form of thinking. I know we don't think of it that way, but it really is. And let me give you an example. There's a famous poem called My Mind to Me a Kingdom Is. Now, that's not the greatest verse in the world, but you can think about that phrase. And it's a list in that the poem is a list of all the reasons why his mind, the mind of this person, I think this is a 16th century poem, the mind of this individual is a, a kingdom. So think about a, a kingdom. You know, if you're if you're imagining as a metaphor, your mind is a kingdom, one way to, to imagine that is, what kind of kingdom are you going to have? How many, you know, are you going to let everybody in indiscriminately? Are you going to let some people in and not others? Who, what kind of 
uh, diplomats are you going to le let into your place? What kind of uh, outside influences are you going to allow in? You know, so w when you contemplate the idea of your mind being a kingdom and the things, you know, what kind of outside influences are you going to allow into your kingdom? That really gives you something to think about with regards to your mind. And it's a kind of an accurate, interesting concept. So my, all I'm saying, and my, one of my points is, that that analogy or metaphor is thinking. That's what thinking is. Me metaphorical language and comparing one thing to another that seems like they have nothing in common. I mean, what does a mind have to do with a kingdom? It seems like it has nothing in common, but in fact, when you think of my mind as a kingdom, there's actually a lot of interesting things that you can come to. As I said, what kind of ruler of the kingdom are you going to be? Are you going to be a dictator and just demand things? Are you going to be, you know, more democratic? Are you going to just let anybody do whatever they want and not think about it? So my point is simply that if you're not thinking in analogies, metaphors, similes, if you're not doing that, you're actually not thinking. There's not what's going on in your head if you're not making similarities and differences in the things that you're that are coming into your cranium. You're not thinking. And the best place to go for training in that is poetry. So the poem today is called The Castaway. It has a very literal, specific story that it's telling, which I'll read you a quick, my, my you know, cruddy little full uh, or prose translation of the whole uh, 11 stanza poem. Then I'll read it, and then we'll uh, kind of do a quick uh, 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 converse with verse. But my point is that think of the castaway as a specific real thing, a person who's a cast castaway, and you'll see the story. But how does it apply to your whole life, and how can you – you know, use that and contemplate and think about that analogy, that metaphor of being a castaway. So um, just as you see, this is the, the poem here, and I'll, I'll bring it up in a second again. But let me read this quick little, uh, what I call my full prose translation. So one of the things I recommend doing in reading poetry is understand you're not going to understand any of it. Understand you're not going to understand any of it, or very little of it. And so as you're going through it, you know, I recommend uh, defining some of the words and just writing it in the margins. And, you know, each stanza, I would recommend after you've done a full read through once or twice, doing like little translations. This is like little translations of the stanza. What does the stanza mean in normal writing prose versus poetry? And that is going to make it integrate into your mind and allow you to be a better thinker. It will improve your ability to use, to, to, you know, do the kind of comparisons that a great poet does. So the essential story of the castaway is that while at, out at sea, a man falls overboard during a terrible storm. He and his crew are all brave men, and they, they're all good men, and their ship was the strongest and sturdiest of their time. This is in 1790s. When, uh, but when life destines, you know, uh, destines death, death will come. No human power could withstand the onslaught of undulating wave upon wave beating their sturdy ship. They threw overboard all manner of object in attempting to provide aid for the fallen man. But nature shot their ship like a cannon scudding, scudding through the stormy night, farther and farther away from their compatriot. Despite real, railing against his fate, the man overboard does not condemn his fellows, for he understands that they have no choice. Every moment he is out at sea alone, in the last waning moments of his life, he is staving off the fate, and it feels like an eternity. But his fate is sealed. The, man still, the men still aboard mourn him as they listen to his cries over the roiling waves until he has heard no more. In all accounts of this event, he was a hero, but no poet speaks of this man. Instead, Cowper speaks as uh, of him as like each of us are castaways, and most wretched of all is Cowper himself. So I'm going to go ahead and read this poem. And, you know, one of the ways you're going to tend to hear this poem understood or, or analyzed is in the deep psycho like a deep psych psychological um, 
understanding or desire to understand Cowper's psychology, which I think is not very helpful. Or I should rephrase, I think that's not the way you should understand poetry. It gives you a wrong impression of poetry. So you can find interesting insights by looking at what was going on with the poet, but the whole point of poetry is to teach you and to help you see the world differently, the similarities, the differences, the universal and the particular, the particular and the universal, which is very prevalent in this case. So I'm going to read the whole poem all the way through, and then, um, uh, then we'll do a little converse with verse. So listen along to The Castaway by William Cowper. Obscurest night involved the sky. The Atlantic billows roared when such destined wretch as I washed headlong from on board. Of friends of hope, of all bereft, his floating home forever left. No braver chief could Albion boast than he with whom he went, nor ever ship left Albion's coast with warmer wishes sent. He loved them both, but both in vain, nor him beheld, nor her again. Not long beneath the whelming brine, expert to swim he lay, nor soon he felt his strength decline, or courage die away, but waged with death a lasting strife, supported by despair of life. He shouted, nor his friends had failed to check the vessel's course, but so the furious blast prevailed, that pitiless perforce, they left their outcast mate behind and scudded still before the wind. Some succor yet they could afford, and such as storms allowed, the cask, the coop, the floated cord, delayed not to bestow. But he they knew, nor ship nor shore, whate'er they gave, they gave should visit more. Nor, cruel as it seemed, could he their haste himself condemn, aware that flight in such a sea alone could rescue them. Yet bitter felt it still to die, deserted, and his friends so nigh. He long survives who lives an hour in ocean, self-upheld. And so long he, with un unspent power, his destiny repelled, and ever as the minutes flew, entreated help or cried, Adieu. At length his transient respite passed, his comrades, who before had heard his voice in every blast, could catch the sound no more. For then, by toil subdued, he drank the stifling wave, and then he sank. No poet wept him, but the page of narrative sincere that tells his name, his worth, his age, is wet with Anson's tear and tears by bards or heroes shed alike immortalize the dead. I therefore propose not or dream, purpose not or dream, descanting on his fate, to give the melancholy theme a more enduring date. But misery still delights to trace its semblance in another's case. No voice divine the storm allayed, no light propitious shone, when snatched from all effectual aid, we perish, each alone. But I beneath a rougher sea, and whelmed in deeper gulfs than he. Okay, so as usual, we're going to go through this uh, stanza by stanza. And if you go to in a few minutes, you have to give me a couple minutes to uh, get everything uploaded. But if you go to kirkbarbera.com, you'll be able to see a uh, dis you'll, you'll be able to see like definitions that I have that I think are helpful for the poem. But I really recommend that you do this if you can um, to kind of see the process of defining and then reading and then translating for yourself. Because again, this trains you to be a better thinker. 
This actually improves your ability to think. And, and this is applied to also if you want to be a rhetorician, which includes sales, marketing, business, if you want to do anything like that really well, it really helps to have a fine tongue. Okay. So first, let's go through uh, each stanza real quick. So in the first stanza, we have Obscurus night involved the sky, the Atlantic billows roared, when such a destined wretch as I washed headlong from on board. Of friends washed headlong from on board, of friends of hope of all bereft, his floating home forever left. So I, I have a feeling that this may in your mind be feel very fuzzy. Like you may have some kind of idea, okay, so obscurus night involved the sky. I don't know, like how does obscure night involve a sky? But you might get an idea that, okay, he's trying to say something about the night sky is obscure. And obviously it's the, the Atlantic. And if you look up billows, billows means in this sense, I think a, a large undulating wave. So if you define that, you could probably get an idea, and you, you might even be feeling what's going on on some level, if you're like me anyway, um, although that may take a little bit of reading poetry to get there. But, you know, you might get, okay, so there's an obscure night, it's on the Atlantic, the billows roaring, you know, uh, when such a destined wretch as I, the hell does that have to do with anything? You don't know, by the way, what that means until you read the poem once. Often the way to unlock a poem, the key to unlocking a poem is the poem itself. This is always true of great art, is that the key to unlocking something, if it's like a puzzle, you know, the puzzle piece that you are needing is the entirety of the puzzle. This is, um, there was a great cr uh, poet and cr uh, critic who said that poems are blood, imagination, and something else soul or something i can't remember but it's, it's basically you know blood imagination and you know life roiling and turning together and the true is the whole w-h-o-l-e so one of the reasons why poetry is so hard to understand is because most people just read it once you need to read a poem five times ten times before you can understand it because the the S, like uh, the key is in the actual poem. So this phrase here, when such a destined wretch as I, oops, won't make any sense until you read the end. The end will then, you know, inform the beginning. So think of it as like a circle. The poem, you know, it's it's done in this line, you know, this line here. Um, but it's really it's kind of like a if you put it in a circle, it actually might make more sense. Um, because it all goes together. Okay, obscurus night involved the sky, the Atlantic billows roared, when such a destined wretch as I. Ooh. Sorry about that. Um, when such a destined wretch as I, whatever that means, washed headlong from on board. So it sounds like he's saying, I washed overboard. Uh, washed headlong from on board of friends of hope of all bereft, his floating home forever left. But if you read this again, when such a destined wretch as I. So it, seem, it seems like there's this obscure night in the Atlantic. Someone falls overboard who's like this, whoever this I is. Maybe it's William Cowper. And um, is separated from friends, hope, and of all bereft, his floating home forever left. Okay. So my um, translation is simply during a dark and stormy night aboard a sea vessel, a man falls overboard. Really simple. <laughs> I keep things chill, man. Not really. Okay. Um, all right. So we got we got the next one. No, no braver chief could Albion boast. Now, by the way, translate or uh, define things. All you need is your bloody phone, man, and you're good to go. Get a dictionary on your phone. It doesn't have to be perfect. I know some people might freak out about that, but it doesn't have to be a perfect dictionary. Just get a dictionary so you have some idea of what the hell he's talking about. Because I don't know what Albion boast is actually, even though I had read that before. But Albion is just a poetic term for England or Britain. So, you know, no braver chief could Albion boast. Okay, so now that you know that it means Britain, it's pretty simple. So you got Britain. This is like a great uh, chief who, you know, no braver chief could Albion boast on this ship. Maybe that's the person who went overboard. I don't know. Then he with whom he went. 
Okay, so maybe he's maybe it's not referring to the guy who went overboard. Maybe it's who he went with on this trip. So I take this to mean it's the captain. So the captain's a great captain. Um, nor ever ship left Albion's coast. Okay, so we have a great sturdy ship. Now it does help to know the the era. So, uh, but although it applies today, I mean, you hear about carnival cruises. Apparently, two hundred people have fallen over in the past, like two hundred or uh, uh, 10, 20 years or something like that. Uh, even less than that. It's like, it seems like a lot to me <laughs> to be falling over on these carnival cruises. But anyway, so no braver chief could Albion boast than he with whom he went. Nor ever ship left Albion's England's coast with warmer wishes sent. So this is sent on a special mission. People, you know, uh, put all their hopes and efforts into this particular boat and the captain, or in this case, you'll find out it's a Commodore. Um, he, he's a Lord. He loved them both, but both in vain. I think that he pronoun, I believe, is referring to the drown or the, the fallen overboard man. He loved them both. That's the chief and the ship. But it could be that the, uh, you could take it as the uh, captain loves the men who fall overboard and the ship. So it could be one of those two. Uh, but I think the but both in vain uh, is, is kind of a key that it's probably the guy who fell overboard. All right. So he loved them both, but both in vain, nor him beheld, nor her again. Okay. So actually, no, it's definitely the... Um, the guy who fell overboard because he doesn't behold them ever again. So my translation is the captain of the ship was the bravest and best captain in England. And then they went on a famously strong seafaring, or this is from a, a famously strong seafaring culture, England. Uh, and the ship was strong and sturdy, the best of England as well. The man who fell overboard loved both the captain and country and ship, but his love could not save him. Okay, not long beneath the whelming brine, which just means salt water. Expert to swim he lay. So he's just floating there. He's an expert swimmer, it says. And he's just kind of laying there. In, but again, this isn't a calm weather, though. So he's kind of bobbing up and down in these really stormy weather or stormy waves. Um, nor soon he felt his strength decline or courage die away. So soon he starts to feel his strength to climb and his courage. So he gets scared, basically, and he becomes weaker and weaker. You can only tread water for so long, but waged with death a lasting strife, supported by despair of life. So he's it's this kind of idea that he's waging a war you know, against death. So every moment is a struggle. Now, that's going to be important I think toward the overarching theme of the castaway. Okay, but my quick translation is he quickly swam and paddled to the surface of the ocean, but quickly began to feel his courage fade. He got scared and he made a wager, um, or, or he struggled so mightily with death uh, that bolstered only by a desperate desire to live. Okay, next stanza. He shouted, nor his friends had failed to check the vessel's course. But so the furious blast per prevailed that pitiless perforce. They left their outcast mate behind and scudded still before the wind. Okay, so furious blast, I actually do define that one, even though we kind of know what a furious blast is. But I think that's it's important to think about that that's the strength of the waves. So... He you know, he's shouting to his friends, why don't his friends turn around? Well, it's 1799, but even if it's not, it's really difficult to just turn around in the middle of a storm like that. So they're having difficulty checking the vessel's course or you know, changing the course because the furious blast, these intense waves are blasting against the prow of the ship and they're you know, making the ship go in a certain direction. That pitiless perforce, perforce is a really interesting word, um, it, it's used to express necessity or inevitability. So, for example, amateurs perforce have to be have to settle for less expensive solutions. So, another way of thinking about it is it means by force or by necessity. So, this has to happen. So, that pitiless perforce they left their uh, that pitiless perforce, and it's, I think it's basically saying that by you know the strength of the nature that they're living in this ship is sent on its way and you can't 
You can't do anything about it. They left their outcast mate behind and scudded still before the wind. Scudded, by the way, means move fast, basically in a straight line, but as pushed by the wind. So the, the ship is just shooting out and they cannot come back to him. He's left farther and farther and farther behind. Okay, the next stanza, I'm going to skip the prose translation because I already basically said it. Okay, uh, a couple words here. So sucker, uh, this is the British spelling, obviously. This is written by a Brit in 1799. Okay, so sucker means assistance and support in times of hardship and distress. You probably know what a cask is. A coop, I think, isn't a, a chicken coop. I think it's something that works with the cask. I, I couldn't actually find a very good definition of it. But uh, and then the floated cord, I just it, I think it's just a rope. And so basically, what you're doing is they're trying to give aid that whatever they could afford in the storm. So remember, the men are trying to survive on their own as well. They have their own problems in this intense storm, but they're trying to give whatever aid sucker to the man who fell overboard that they can. So they throw over a cask, a coop, a, a rope, and um, they delayed not to bestow, which means to give those things to him. And, um, but he, they knew no, no ship, no shore, whatever they gave should visit more. So, that's, you know, one of the great things about romantic poetry, and I'm going to say this over and over and over. It's a great quote from Oscar Wilde. Any man who calls a spade a spade is fit only to use one. And what I, what he means by that is that in romantic li literature, especially, it behooves you, and I think this is true in living life, once in a while it kind of is nice to not use just the language of ev everyday language. And one of the reason, one of the simple reasons for that is that it's more exciting. It's just a different way of looking at things. So instead of saying, you know, um, but he, they, they would never see him again. That'd be a simple way of saying that. But they said, but he, they knew, nor ship, nor shore, whatever they gave should visit shore more. So just another way of saying that no matter what they did for him, he would never find shore again. What that does, I think, to your mind is it, it gives you different ways of understanding the world and seeing the world. And I mean, I think that's just a very helpful way of expanding your mind and improving your mind. It's kind of like we're lifting weights. It's, it's an exercise. Okay, next stanza. Nor cruel as it seemed could he their haste himself condemn, aware that flight in such a sea alone could rescue them. Yet bitter felt it still to die, deserted, and his friend so nigh. So nigh just means uh, near. So here's my little translation. Even in his desperate plight, the man overboard couldn't blame or condemn the shipmates for abandoning him. Abandoning him. Even were they to have the power to turn the ship around, their only hope for survival in this instance was to escape the onslaught of the storm. Nevertheless, he does feel a bitterness, of course, that he was deserted with his friends seemingly so close at hand. So it's one of the tr great tragedies of this kind of thing is that you're, you know, it's um, like if you saw, what was that Sandra Bullock movie? Uh, Gravity. If you saw that movie Gravity, where it's like you're so close to something, you know, when she's trying to reach out to the spaceship when she's outside of it, she's so close, but she's not quite able to get it. And that's, you know, a horrible feeling, I would imagine is being so close to something and not being able to grasp onto it, not being able to, you know, uh, to get it. And, and so his friends are really close. I mean, close-ish, although they're shooting away from him and he can't get to them. Okay. So now, where are we? All right. So the next stanza. He long survives who lives an hour in ocean self up upheld. So again, more way, different ways to say something um, that you might say, you know, one way to say this, translate this is like anyone who every second surviving in a um, in a situation like this where you're stranded at sea and you're just floating in the ocean, self upheld or upheld by your own power is like an eternity. He long survives. So every second is like a, a, an hour, it's like a day, it's like a month, like it's eternity. Who, who lives an hour in ocean. And so long he, with unspent power, his destiny repelled. So, and so, so he's pushing away his destiny. 
So at this point, I hope you're starting to see a little bit of the metaphor of life here. We're all this castaway. We all have this destiny of we're going to die. I know that doesn't sound happy, but it's true. And so long he, with unspent power, his destiny repelled. So as he's fighting for this, he's he's kind of you know, um, pushing away his destiny. He's repelling it for as long as he can. And ever as the minutes flew, entreated help or cried adieu. So he's either asking for help or saying goodbye. Um, and goodbye, by the way, a duke also can mean to God, which is another way of thinking like you're going to die and you're going to go up to God. Okay, so next one. At length his transient respite passed, his comrade, comrades, who before had heard his voice in every blast, could catch the sound no more. So his transient respite, respite, uh, transient means lasting only for a short time. Respite means a short period of rest or relief from something difficult or unpleasant. So, so what is the transient respite, um, which has gone past, really? His comrades who before his heard. So at length, his transient respite passed. So the, the respite of him dying, I think, is passing. His comrades who before had heard his voice in every blast, the blast of the ocean. So you can imagine, you know, try to picture this, like, and you hear the friend, you know, uh, kind of crying in the background, help, help, help. And then it gets lower and like every time, help, help. it goes lower and lower every time. Because eventually had every, had heard his voice in every blast, could catch the sound no more. For then by toil subdued, he drank the stifling wave, and then he sank. So he drank the sight. I think that's pretty clear what that means. No poet wept him. So there's no poet, abo poet aboard the ship. Nobody with that kind of sentiment cried for him. But the page of narrative sincere that tells his name, his worth, his age, is wet with Anson's tear. Now, this does require a little bit of inside knowledge to understand this. I didn't know this. I had to look it up. It's the great thing about living in the 21st century. Just look at the heck up. It's out there. It's really simple. So George Anson, uh, or Commodore Anson, led a squadron of ships in a war against Spain in the late 1700s, basically around this time. It was from an account of Anson's voyage where a man is thrown overboard, and, and Anson writes about it, that Cowper writes this poem. So Cowper wrote or read about this incident in just a normal prose. You know, uh, 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 George Anson is writing about how this man fell overboard and, and about their mission and everything. And Cowper reads it and feels a great affinity or a connection to the man who fell, fell overboard. And he was inspired to write this grand poem. Now, this is really important because part of what a poet and what poetry does is it helps you translate the world that you see and see it in a different light, see it in a universal light. It's not, it's tragic that an individual soul died, but what Cowper is starting to show you in his view, whether you agree with it or not, is a separate issue. But his view is that we're all this castaway out in the ocean, you know, separated from our fellow man dying in the ocean, or about to die. So he's taking this particular issue and he's making it a universal truth. And there is some truth to it. I mean, we are kind of like that. Now, you may quibble with some of that, but that's fine. We are a bit like that. So, uh, and tears by bards or heroes shed alike immortalize the dead. It's the last part of that stanza. The next stanza. Um, 10. I therefore purpose not or dream, descanting on his fate to give the melancholy theme a more enduring date. So, you know, this one I think is really interesting. Descant, and, and I think I'm saying that right, is an independent uh, melody basically sung uh, above a basic melody. Or you just think about, I think, as a melodious song. That's what it is. Or um, I saw a literary definition of it was talk tediously or at length. So I think he's trying to say something along the lines of, I don't, you know, I, even though I'm a poet, I don't pur purpose 
to dream or to talk tediously about this particular instance to give the melancholy theme a more enduring fate date. So this is where I'm a little confused. I think what he means is he's going to give the melancholy theme a more enduring date. So I purpose not or dream to, to descanting on his fate, to talk tediously on his fate. But I think what he's saying is I do propose to give a melancholy theme a more enduring date, but misery still delights to trace its semblance in another's case. So it could be, pro I'm probably wrong about that. I think he's saying he's not going to give a melancholy theme, uh, you know, this the theme of this incident, an enduring date, or at least he doesn't want to. I therefore propose not or dream descanting on his fate, this individual person who fell overboard, but misery still delights to trace its semblance in another's case. So it's almost like, it seems like misery is making him tell this story. Misery is making him trace the form of this universal case and how it applies to Cowper and the rest of us. Okay, the last stanza. No voice divine the storm allayed, no light propitious shone, when snatched from all effectual aid, we perished each alone. But I, beneath a rougher sea, and whelmed in deeper gulfs than ye. So, no voice divine the, um, the storm allayed. Allayed means diminish or put to rest. So no divine voice. So no, God does not help here. <laughs> so Kalper is saying God does not did not help that man, and he's not going to help you. Uh, I think that's the implication of this this poem. Is God's not there. His uh, what is it called? His uh, providence is not going to do anything. No no voice divine the storm allayed. No light propitious shone. So propitious is basically favorably disposed. So he could be saying that maybe just that gods aren't really interested in us anymore, or at least not in this individual person. When snatched from all effectual aid, we perished each alone. But I beneath, beneath a rougher sea and whelmed in deeper gulfs than he. But I beneath, beneath a rougher sea and whelmed in deeper gulfs than he. So I remember what I said about this beginning in this first stanza. We're going back here. Those roared when such a destined wretch as I washed headlong from on board, the friends of hope of all bereft. So this is how Cowper is uniting the universal with the particular or with this one event of a man falling overboard is a destined wretch as I, Cowper, but also as all of us are. But none, again, you know, it's going back and forth, but I beneath, we perished, we as human beings perished each alone, but I beneath a rougher sea and whelmed in deeper, deeper gulfs than, than he. So Cowper is overwhelmed by deeper gulfs than the man who actually fell overboard and died. Now, the last thing I want to say, so that's just a basic uh, converse with verse about the, the translating the different stanzas, what I think the poem is about. Now it helps to kind of put the theme into your own words and what you think the story, like what is the person, the, the poet Cowper here, really trying to communicate? And I'll just say that even if you're not that interested in, you know, mastering, you know, all of poetry, it helps to have these kinds of images in your mind. I mean, play with the castaway. Look at him out at the ocean. How are you like him? That's the point, by the way, I think of the movie the Gal or the Gra or Gravity with Sandra Bullock. That's kind of the point of that movie, although there's a happier ending with that. And there's so there's another thing that's going on, but a lot of it is the struggle of life and that you're out at the ocean. You're bereft of your friends, of hope, of all these things. That's that's what Cowper believes. So you have to ask yourself, do you believe that? And even if you don't, stretching your intellectual legs by thinking about the ship and being with your friends and having things thrown at you, you know, exploring the world in that way does help you think and become a better 
thinker, and it helps you see the world a little bit differently. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed Poems for People Who Hate Poetry, and I'll see you next time for the next Romantic Verse.